Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Randy Phillips. I'm the lead pastor of Life Family, and I want to welcome all of our churches all across Central Texas who have joined us, uh, a host of family and, and friends, and we love you so much. And all of you who are watching behind screens all over the world, uh, you're joining the Life Family Experience. You can join us every single Sunday. Uh, our church has joined with uh, 200 other churches to put up billboards all across uh, greater Austin. What's after ATX? It's to pique the interest of the community to say, what happens after I die? As a pastor, I've had the sacred honor of walking people up to the point of death. And they're asking me as a pastor, what should I look forward to? What happens when I cross over? And this has been intensely curious for all of us recently with the Kobe Bryant passing and his beautiful daughter and, and everyone on that helicopter to even the coronavirus or the fear that's gripping the globe. We are aware of our own mortality and we wonder what's on the other side. Well, there's a man here today who went to the other side, saw it, and came back. Would you welcome Dr. Eben Alexander. Thank you. Glad you're here. I, I would shake your hand, but I better not. <laughs> well, these days we better be safe. Okay. Uh, you are probably uh, the world's most famous person uh, to experience the other side and had what's called a near-death experience. I was shocked to find that one in 25 people in the world have had a near-death experience. Some were kind of marginalized, but others highly credible. Uh, but you, I think you brought it to a place where we could talk about it. And so I am really, really glad you're here. Uh, tell us uh, where you were born. I was born in uh, North Carolina in Charlotte. Uh, and certainly those who've read my story will realize I was also put up for adoption soon after I was born. So that's a huge part of my story and my life journey of uh, kind of recovering that sense of connection uh, and love that in many ways I saw disappear when I was 11 days old and my birth mother had to put me up for adoption. My oh, goodness. The, uh, the, your parents that adopted you, yes. the Alexander family, what was it like to grow up in their home? Well, I couldn't have been more blessed. You know, this, they, they honored all my hopes and dreams. I have three beautiful sisters in that uh, adoptive family. Um, and my father was a tremendous influence to me. He was uh, a neurosurgeon. He was globally renowned. He had been a combat surgeon in the Second World War. And I still have the little battlefield Bible that he took because he had grown up in eastern Tennessee. His own father was a general surgeon. And uh, my dad knew early on uh, the power of God, the power of prayer. Mm. Uh, and, and that's what I think got him through his uh, almost two years in the Pacific Theater during World War II, brought him back to this world where he went on to head up a neurosurgical training program. And for him, as a teacher of science, cosmology, he was fully up to speed on modern uh, science. And yet for him, that fully supported his belief in a loving powerful, personal God that was accessible through prayer. Uh, and yet wow. I grew up in the 60s, so I, I wrestled with that. Yes. You know, always knowing science is a pathway to truth. Uh, but my so father did was you right. Follow, you followed in the path of your uh, neurologist father. Did you follow also in his faith? Well, I struggled. Uh, you know, for I know I wanted to believe. I, I can tell you when I went through my sixth grade confirmation in the Methodist church there in North Carolina, I, I felt like I was teaching my Sunday school teacher about the Big Bang and cosmology and all this stuff, thinking I knew so much. Uh, and, um, you know, in retrospect, I, I did follow in my father's footsteps, but it was a long period of kind of struggle to understand it that included eight years of kind of staunch agnosticism before my coma. And I think those eight years were important. Skepticism is very important. Yes. Uh, because it helps us to strengthen our faith, faith. And that's why I think it's so important to uh, come at this with a very open mind uh, because the, the open mind is what allows us to see this deep truth that's apparent all around us. 
of the reality of God, the eternity of soul, yes. uh, that we're here to live in love and kindness and compassion with each other. Uh, these are ancient lessons. So your feeling up to that point of those eight years was you die and then nothing? Well, I think that was it. I kind of succumbed. Uh, the reason I went into that dark night of the soul for those eight years, uh, as I tell in the book Proof of Heaven, was because of a perceived rejection from my birth family, uh, birth mother. I had, uh, for most of my life, just uh, gotten used to the fact that she was out there, but I'd never meet her, my birth mother. Um, but then my older son was doing a school project in the year 2000 that involved deeper research into our, our family uh, genealogy. And so I wrote another letter to the children's home, but this time I got an answer that shocked me no end, that not only was my birth mother out there, but that my birth parents had ended up getting married and had three children, but that the youngest daughter had already passed two years before that in 1998. And the story that was told to me was they were still grieving the loss of that daughter and they couldn't face mm. welcoming me back into their lives. And it was that perceived rejection that really tipped me over the deep end. And that led to a very severe dark night of the soul, which was then answered with my coma journey in 2008, where I saw uh, the absolute reality of God and eternity of soul and our connectedness with God yes. and the power of prayer. So you're, you, your wife and you live where? We're in Virginia. Um, uh, my former spouse uh, lives down in Lynchburg. We're still very close. Uh, but as often happens in about 80, 85% of near-death experiences, uh, a marriage may not survive it. And, really? And ours well, why is not. that? Well, it's because you end up on such, you're on certain pathways uh, that have been based on your life experience so far. And a near-death experience can change direction so radically. Uh, and we came to realize we were just not on the, on the same path to stay together. Uh, we're still very close. We raise our sons together. Our sons are 20 and 30. Um, and there's still tremendous love there, but we just realized we we're on, on different pathways. The, uh, and you live in, in, Virginia, in Virginia, close to Washington, D.C., but yeah. you stay out of that. Well, I say as far away from D.C. as I can. Well, <laughs> we're out, out in Charlottesville, and I would highly encourage. Uh, it's a beautiful area, very much like this area. It's very hilly, and then you've got the beautiful mountains. Um, we love it. It's, have you been to Austin before? I have been here before, and I love Austin. Well, come I back. really do. I love the people, and uh, it's just a beautiful community, a very uh, lovely music environment. So I'm glad we're, to be back. We're really glad you're here. Uh, you Tell us about your medical journey, You where, uh, where you got your degree, and then where you practiced. And okay, I went to a Duke Medical School. I finished there in 1980. Uh, then I did my residency training at Duke, plus two years up at Harvard. And then in 1988, I started on faculty at Harvard Medical School. And that's where I stayed until 2001. And then I, I uh, have been to several other institutions uh, teaching, uh, teaching neurosurgery. Um, and now I'm doing what I, I really came here to yeah. do, which is to kind of share the beauty of my journey. And, and yes. it was crucial all the neurosurgical experience in science and cosmology and physics. Because in fact, so many people believe that in our current culture, there's a battle between you know, scientific, rational, uh, intellectual people and people who believe in spirit and faith in God. And in fact, the two strengthen each other tremendously. Yes. I mean, right at the core of, of the mysteries of quantum physics is an absolute demand of the reality of our spiritual nature in a spiritual universe. Uh, it's mm. really a very powerful kind of scientific proof uh, in many ways of the reality of God and the afterlife and eternity of soul. Well, wow, that's it's incredibly fascinating. As a neur uh, neurologist, when uh, you were also, uh, what you said, a, a raging agnostic, uh, how did you explain or negate people who had near-death experiences, saw something, came back and talked about it. How, how did you, as a, a person not of faith, explain that? Well, I, I would say during those years of agnosticism, um, I had defaulted to uh, kind of a strong belief in materialism or physicalism, that only the physical world exists. And I can tell you, uh, anyone interested in neuroscience realizes 
Materialism has never remotely explained anything about the nature of consciousness. In fact, scientific materialism demands that you admit to having no free will at all because they believe consciousness is just uh, an epiphenomenon, a side effect of the chemical reactions and electron fluxes in the brain. And the truth is that is absolutely false. Consciousness is far more than that. There's evidence of non-local consciousness. Uh, prayer and meditation can open the doors to a tremendous uh, development of a relationship with that primordial mind, that primordial God force. And it's something we all share. So it, would you, would, you would say it's the side effects or, or, or something's happening with the dying brain or... I thought it was all hallucinations. Okay. I just said, you know, that uh, it, it's just a, a trick of the dying brain. That was kind of the language we used. And I would, I would not take away hope from my patients. I mean, I was supportive of their belief systems, but I was not volunteering my personal beliefs to them that it was all just a hallucination. But uh, since my experience, and certainly as I've studied many other near-death experiences and met thousands of people who have had them, and many of those people have never heard of any literature on near-death experiences. They had no idea what it was that they had, yes. but they were shocked by it. Many of them would come up to me after my talks and say, I've never shared this before with anyone, but, and they'd tell me a story, and it might have happened 50 or 60 years ago of a profound near-death experience they had, but they wouldn't talk about it. It is so shocking. It's the exact opposite of what materialist science predicts. Mm. You know, that your, your awareness will go down to zero as your brain snuffs out. In fact, the brain is a filter, it's a reducing valve that limits conscious awareness so that the, what you actually experience is the opposite of that. It's where your consciousness expands, you reunite with higher souls, yeah. souls of departed loved ones in this brilliant realm of beauty and joy and love soaking, basking in that beautiful ocean of pure, unconditional love of God. And uh, it's so unexpected and so shocking. Yes. Scripture talks about uh, no eye has seen and no ear has heard and no mind has conceived uh, what God has prepared for those who love him. On November 10, 2008, 2008 tell us about that day. Well, uh, I woke up about 4.30 in the morning with severe back pain, headache, um, I remember my uh, younger son, Bond, came in the room. I had tried to get in a warm bath. Your younger son, what? His, his name is Bond. Bond? Bond. It, James? And, and, uh, <laughs> well, actually, that was, that, that's a long story. I won't okay. get into it. Well, but, another but time. His na his na <laughs> Eben and I, the older son and I, wanted to name him James Bond Alexander. It was a family name from my, from my former spouse's side of the family. Really? And, in fact, the patriarch of four generations earlier of that name was James Bond. Um, and so that's what we wanted. And she wouldn't hear of it because she thought everybody would joke about that. And as it is, they do anyway. You know, once yeah, they, they hear do. his name is Bond, <laughs> James Bond? <laughs> Just like I did. Right, but, but that name was very appropriate. As you had a severe back. Back pain, headache. Head. And then the next thing my family knew is I was uh, lapsed into general uh, uh, epileptic seizures. And I was in uh, grand mal uh, status. Um, which meant I was just seizing and completely unconscious. And that's when they called the uh, EMTs, took me off to the Lynchburg General Hospital emergency room, um, and uh, did a lumbar puncture. Out came thick white pus under pressure. Uh, I was, uh, uh, my neurologic exam showed uh, devastation. In fact, there's a medical case report on my medical records. It just came out in September 2018 by three doctors who were not involved in my care. Uh, and people who want to see that case report can go to my website and look at the blog posting from September 2018. It gets you right to it. But um, the reality is I just went deep into coma, and it was a severe case of uh, E. coli bacterial meningitis, which mm -hmm. is a real shocker because almost all cases of E. coli meningitis occur in newborns. It's very rare to encounter it beyond the age of three months. So I do have to defend my level of maturity, but... Uh, <laughs> something I got to live with, but it was a deep mystery to my doctors. You know, how did this happen? Uh, and then I, I deteriorated through that week on three powerful antibiotics. They'd had me on a ventilator from the get-go, and it was day seven. It was a Sunday morning when they finally held a, a family conference saying it was time to stop the antibiotics and mm. let me go. 
Um, and that's, uh, they had kept the worst news from Bond during the week. You know, they told him, Daddy's sick. But when he went to the hospital, what he saw was his daddy's corpse lying there being inflated by this machine. Mm. Uh, and so it was very frightening. And once he heard the doctors recommend stopping antibiotics, Bond came running into the room and he pulled my eyelids open. My eyes had been taped shut. One eye over here, one eye up there, neither pupil responding. Those of you in medicine realize that's a, a very poor sign. And he was pleading with me, Daddy, you're going to be okay. Daddy, you're going to be okay. And I didn't understand the words. And I promise you, I did not see him with my eyes and hear him with my ears because those were long since disconnected from this world. But that spiritual presence, I knew mm. he was pleading with me. And I knew I had to come back. Yes. But I had no idea who he was because one of the unusual features of my near-death experience is that I was amnesic. I had no memory of Evan Alexander's life. I had no language, no words, no knowledge of Earth, this universe. It was a completely empty slate, and that's quite unusual for an NDE, but I think it was important in teaching me some of the deeper lessons. So you, you have no brain activity? My brain was uh, shut down. There's something called the Glasgow Coma Scale that you use to measure coma. Anybody in this room would score a 15. That means they're doing great. If you're a corpse, you get a 3. Anything below 9 is deep coma. And uh, for the vast majority of that week in coma, I was around a six or seven, sometimes as low as a five. So I was in deep coma the whole time. They had CT and MRI scan data showing that all eight lobes of my brain were affected. No part was spared. And that's why to have an extraordinarily rich experience, far more real than anything I'd ever experienced in my life, which is what happened in that near-death experience, completely violates everything I thought I knew about brain-mind Because you need a conscious brain to experience... But no, you don't. The brain okay. is a filter. Its main function is actually to restrict consciousness down to this tiny little illusion of kind of self and non-self, you know, all the stuff out there, and a here and now. But uh, so much of that is really a fiction, and that's why centering prayer meditation yes. can show us a much richer... So you step, you step over from this world into the next. What happened? Well, for me, that journey began in a very primitive, coarse, unresponsive realm. It was like being in dirty jello. I called it the earthworm's eye view. Uh, and I was there for a very long period of time. I'm sure I didn't have any kind of memory formation moment to moment. So it seemed to last forever. But the good news is it didn't. I was rescued by this slowly spinning pure white light with fine silvery and golden tendrils and as it came towards me I realized it came with a perfect musical melody and thus music vibration frequency become a tremendous theme for my journey mm. because it's music uh, uh, not music heard with the ears because in those realms our awareness goes far beyond the limitations of physical eyes and ears and a physical brain um, in the in the dirty jello uh-huh but I was in that realm. Were you afraid? I was not. And the, one of the reasons was that, um, again, that amnesia. I had no knowledge of anything else. That was the only existence I'd ever known. I had absolutely no memories whatsoever of a life on this earth. Initially, I explained all that, you know, when I was coming back in those months when my mind was writing itself. I explained it by saying, well, I know my neocortex was horribly damaged by this. Um, we have all the medical evidence for that. And to me, I was still defaulting to my older beliefs that memories are stored in the neocortex. So the fact that all of that was damaged, to me, explained, okay, that's where that mm -hmm. lack of memory came from. But, of course, then there's the giant mystery of how is it over two months after my coma, everything came back. And, in fact, the evidence for me is that memories came back more clear and complete than they had been before the coma. Really? It just shows us, and we discussed this in our third book, Living in a Mindful Universe, how memories are not even stored in the brain. But that is such a nail in the coffin of materialist neuroscience that you don't hear it discussed very much. But the good news is that beautiful spinning white light up and up and opened up into a brilliant ultra-real realm that I call the Gateway Valley. And that was filled with many Earth-like features. It was uh, a, a world of perfection and ideals. There was no death or decay anywhere. Uh, beautiful, lush plant life, flowers, buds on trees, blossoms, colors beyond the rainbow. I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly wing among millions of butterflies, looping and spiraling in vast formations above this, this uh, gateway valley. And in that valley were thousands of beings dancing, lots of joy and merriment. 
And when I wrote it all up weeks later, I said these were souls. I knew there were souls mm. between lives and that there was this incredible joy and merriment going on. And it was all being fueled because up above were these swooping orbs, pure uh, spiritual orbs of divine energy, these, uh, which, which I came to call angelic choirs when I had to put a, a label on them. But it was the anthems and chants and hymns that would thunder down from this beautiful chorus of angels above that was fueling this incredible festivity of sparkling waterfalls into crystal blue pools and all of this joy and merriment and children playing and dogs jumping. So incredible your, your, happiness. Your senses are heightened and not contained and not Correct. confined. Got to remember, our brain and our, our, our uh, eyes and ears, they give us a very kind of uh, diluted down version of, of reality compared to that. Mm -hmm. There, it's like drinking through a fire hose, an incredible uh, ocean of this uh, loving awareness. And for me, in that beautiful Gateway Valley realm, on the wing of that butterfly, uh, my first awareness of the divine was a sense of a divine wind or a... a uh, the breath of God, as I called it in some of my early writings, that blew through. And it was amazing because even though the elements of the scene stayed the same, all of a sudden I realized the incredible power of that divine force, of that uh, causal force of an infinitely loving God. Uh, not a judging God, one of infinite love, of being home, of our spiritual essence, mm. of the purity of our being with with comfort that really goes beyond any so, words. So you felt comforted. And that's why... You so, felt at peace. Absolutely. And that is such a beautiful lesson that comes not just from my near-death experience, but from near-death experiences yeah. across all cultures, all nations, going back several thousand years. The stories are always of this beautiful peace, like we are home. Mm. This incredible joy and oneness and that God force of pure, infinite love is so healing. Uh, the good news is you don't need a near-death experience to know this. That's right. You know, and, and as uh, many who have discovered the power of prayer and going yeah. within, for me, I often call it meditation, but it's absolutely a form of centering prayer yes. and honoring uh, God's uh, beautiful love. Uh, is The near-death experience uh, commonality, some of them, is a life review. Yes. Did you have that at all? Well, I saw life reviews. Now, it's important, again, that amnesia made it impossible for me to go through an Eben Alexander life review. But I saw life reviews in two very powerful forms. Uh, one was, and I, I haven't kind of finished the story, it turns out that it didn't all happen in that gateway valley. That, in fact, the music from those angelic choirs provided portals to higher and higher levels all the way out to the core. And the core was infinite uh, inky blackness, but filled to overflowing with that God force mm. of love. And all in the setting of the entire material universe and lower spiritual realms having been shrunk down to this complex oversphere that was there mm. as a source of, of, of lessons and teaching. Uh, but in that realm was this incredible oneness uh, with the divine, a sense that our very conscious awareness is directly connected. There's no separation between us and that God force. Of course, the God force is the pure love, yes. with absolute, uh, unconditional love for all of creation. And you had a, you had a guide. In your book, you talk about yes. the guide came through the music. The guide came once you were over, we had crossed over into what we would call paradise or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your guide. Well, uh, that was one of the most beautiful aspects of this, is witnessing this incredible scene. I wasn't alone. Mm. There was a beautiful young woman uh, beside me on the butterfly wing, and she never spoke a word. She didn't have to. She was dressed in the very s same simple garb and yet beautiful colors of all those thousands of beings dancing down below. And she looked at me with her sparkling blue eyes and high cheekbones, a broad smile, soft brown hair framing her beautiful face, with a look, a look of infinite love. And that, to me, was uh, the essence of the journey. And I think the most important thing for me to bring back was how her awareness came into my mind. And, of course, it wasn't his words when it happened. But when I put it all to words weeks later in writing it all up, the message was very simple. And, of course, there's that beautiful picture. That's exactly... So, so <laughs> you didn't know who this was? No. 
you had I no had no idea. And in fact, I described her to my family and friends within a few days of coming back. I said, there was this beautiful girl, my guardian angel. Uh, and the thing is, I knew her so well from her, her uh, mental, emotional connection with me in my mind. And yet, I realized, and this was especially haunting in the, in the months after my coma when I started reading thousands of near-death experiences and saw that there was always a guardian angel who was somebody very crucial in your life. And I remembered her so perfectly that I knew I'd never met her in my life. And that part was a real shocker. Were you shocker. disappointed that your guide wasn't someone you knew, uh, uh, so your father, for If example. I had scripted this, it would have been my dad. He had passed over four years earlier. He was the most important influence in my life. He was uh, just a, a beautiful soul with a very rich connection with God and belief in prayer and yet very scientific and yeah. all in one beautiful package. And yet he was not there. Wasn't he? I, I felt like I'd been tricked. I mean, in the first few months as I was trying to put this together, I felt, what? how can this be? The most real experience I've ever been through in my life, and my father was not there. And who in the world was that beautiful woman on the butterfly wing? And um, as, as you point out, you know, that was the, the beautiful discovery four months uh, after my coma. Okay. <laughs> Spoiler alert, if you don't want to know who this is, this is a good time to, to cover yours. Can you tell... <laughs> Our wonderful audience and those of you watching from all over the world, how you discovered who this guide was. Well, it, turned, it has to do with the fact that I, I had met my uh, birth family about a year before my coma. And uh, that in itself is just a beautiful story. Uh, and I go into detail about it in Proof of Heaven. Yes. But, the, uh, but the reality is they were still suffering from the loss of, of that uh, that daughter, and so they didn't really want to talk about her too much. And uh, uh, you know what they did share was what a beautiful, angelic, loving soul that she was. Um, and of course, I, I was quite sad as a brother who never got to meet her in this world. And that's why when my uh, birth sister Kathy, um, who who I met, uh, you know, a year before coma, when I met the birth family and expanded all of that, um, she finally sent me a picture. And she promised, um, and I received that picture about four months after my coma. And it turns out it was very important that, that at the same time, because I think I needed some opening in my awareness and in my mindset, at the same time I was reading a beautiful story in Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's book, uh, Life After Death, and in that she tells the story of a 13-year-old girl who had a, uh, you know, was in coma, very sick medically, uh, and in this beautiful journey, she was welcomed to the heavenly realm by her brother. Mm. And he was uh, demonstrated to her that power of unconditional love and the beauty of, that, uh, of God in that realm. And then helped her make a decision to come back to this world. And when she did, she was talking to her father about it. She said, but I don't understand. I don't have a brother. And he said, well, you did. But he died three months before you were born, so we never told you about him. And that's when I looked up at the picture that I just received the afternoon before, and I collapsed on the ground, and my heart pounds, mm. and I, I can't, even now, every time I, I revisit this story, chills running up and down my spine because yes. of the beauty of that recognition uh, of that guardian angel. And all of a sudden, I realized we were deeply connected. Uh, and in fact, it's like she was looking at me in the picture that you showed a few minutes ago, as if to say, do you finally get it? Yeah. Well, yes, Betsy, I finally get it. Yes, there is a lot of you today. Uh, where are my loved ones? Will I meet them again? You have people that have crossed over, and I pray this really touches your heart. You're going to see them again, and you're going to meet them again. There's a number of you precious ladies who have had miscarriages and you wonder, where are my babies? You're going to see them again. You're going to meet them again. When you came back, Dr. Alexander, you came back into your body. Uh, did, was medical science shocked that you came back? Well, the doctors had estimated early in the week that I had about a 10% chance of living through it. After seven days in coma, um, with, uh, you know, just a horrible uh, medical picture in terms of prognosis. Uh, they predicted that had gone down to a 2% chance of survival. 
But in that medical conference they held that Sunday morning, they recommended to the family stopping the antibiotics. And the reason for that is they thought there was no chance for my recovery. That anybody who has bacterial meningitis for that long, that deep a coma, with all the parameters that they measured, there was no way I was coming back to this world. So when I did actually open my eyes on that Sunday morning, they were shocked. <laughs> now, important to point out, uh, I didn't, my brain was so completely savaged by this experience, I had no idea who these beings were standing at my bedside. My sisters, my sons, uh, my former spouse, my mother, I didn't know who they were. Mm. All I remembered was where I'd been, this incredibly rich journey. Uh, and I also had, for about 36 hours after I, I came back to life and they pulled out the breathing tube, I was kind of in and out of a crazy, paranoid, delusional ICU psychosis, a nightmare, uh, back and forth in that world. Uh, and then I'd kind of come back to that ICU bed. But the, the reason I point it out is because the memories of... Of I, initially, when I was writing it all up, I categorized all the memories as the same. I said, it was all just an amazing experience. But the memories from deep coma, in many ways, were far more real, vibrant, and alive uh, than any of the rest of it. And that paranoid delusional nightmare, those memories faded within about a week. The memories from the deep coma experience are as fresh today as if they happened yesterday. Oh, goodness. And that's exactly what all those people who come up to me after a talk and say, I want to share with you something I've never told anybody else. Yes. They, it is shocking. And that was one of the reasons I wrote Proof of Heaven, is to help take the lid off. You know, when millions and millions of people start sharing these stories, yes. there is no doubt yes. of the eternity of soul and the, and the reality of this God. So how long after coma was, did it take you to write Proof of Heaven, your book? Well, um, initially, my interest, especially as I started getting into the science of it, because the science is fascinating, and the science actually supports all of this, yeah. uh, once you realize the, where the leading edges of science are. But um, it took me, you know, I was kind of two years into it, had read more than 100 books on, on all this. I was deeply into it. And I, mainly, I was uh, writing a scientific report for the neuroscience literature about the failures of the materialist model. The brain does not create consciousness at all. It's a filter. It allows primordial consciousness to manifest. And that's what I was working on putting out there. But the more I started giving talks, especially, uh, I mean, uh, in fact, my earliest public uh, admission of any of this uh, came from the fact that we had several friends in Lynchburg, where I lived, uh, who had lost children. Mm. And so I would have lunch with these uh, couples and... and uh, kind of share my story, and they started passing the word around that it was very comforting to them, that it helped oh, them yes. in dealing with the loss of their child, because it came to prove in many ways the reality of the afterlife and our connectedness of souls. And so that was really what got it going, was giving okay. talks to uh, groups who had lost children. Oh, and and that, that was kind of my impetus for taking it to the world, because I realized how uh, kind of positive and affirming my story was yes. to many people, and this was just a way of, of helping to get it out there. But it also depends heavily on the science. So I've given a lot of talks to medical groups and other scientific yes. groups uh, that have to do with the nature of consciousness that uh, defies materialist thought. And conventional science um, is basically lost in the weeds. They, they try and tell you there's no such thing as con uh, consciousness. Yes. Just pretend it, it doesn't even exist. Right. You know, the emperor has... has uh, this beautiful set of clothes. Well, no, he doesn't. He's naked. Yes. So let's admit the fact. And, yes. you know, that's where the empirical op, uh, evidence leads us. And, and it's actually scientists now who are leading the way in this charge of proving the reality that we're spiritual beings in a spiritual yes. universe. And if you try and pretend otherwise, you're defying uh, the deepest tenets of what's emerging in the scientific world. It's not a battle between science and spirituality or science and religion because they actually Lord. strengthen each other tremendously moving Isn't forward. Isn't Love that. It's beautiful. How, uh, mm -hmm. how has this experience changed you personally, your, your temperament, how you treat people, all of that? Well, I realize that we are all one. And I realized, uh, for example, anyone who kind of pushed my buttons and I might have thought of as my nemesis before, <laughs> uh, before my coma, 
that they're actually a near and dear soul mate. Yes. Praying for your enemies is, is, is a beautiful thing because yes. we're all in this together. And if I have friction with someone, uh, to me, it's showing me something about myself that I need to work on. Yes. Uh, always looking within. And, but the other side of that coin is very important. And that is that our internal world becomes the external world. And the more we can use prayer and meditation to connect with the divine, it's amazing to me mm. how those who um, have realized the power of prayer are basically have been proving for thousands of years the reality that is just now coming to the scientific world over the neuroscience of consciousness, philosophy of mind, and quantum physics, which all imply similarly that we're sharing one consciousness, yes. that God mind. We're all part of it. To hurt another is to hurt ourselves. Yes. You brought up the life review earlier. Life reviews occur in anywhere from 25 to 50% of near-death experiences. Going back thousands of years, the life review occurred uh, in uh, Plato's writing of, of Soldier Ur, killed in battle, 2,400 years ago. And he told the same story that in the ears today tell that when you die, you go through a review of life. Yes. If you've been busy pan handing out pain and suffering to others, you have to be on the business end of that in the life review. Mm. Uh, and so in many ways, the life review is a very neutral uh, course correction. But given that most of us would rather be loved, yes. it just shows us that to be loved, give love, and you will, the world will give it back to you in, in, uh, in beautiful fashion. Thank you for being here. I wish we had another hour. Uh, well, thank you so much. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank Dr. You Alex, Eben Alexander, everyone. Thank One you. more time, Thank Austin, you Texas. So much. God bless you Thank all. You, sir. Thank you.